happens when two film critics dress up as Ethel Merman? It's mad! Oh no, Joe. It's a mad, 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 mad world. This week on The Real Watchlist Plus. This week on Real Watchlist Plus, we're doing It's a Mad, Mad, Mad World from 1963. It was nominated for six Oscars, and it was the first successful big-budget comedy ever made. It's a screwball comedy where a group of crazy motorists witness a car crash in the California desert. The driver's dying words divulge a secret, and there's a treasure 200 miles away in a park. This leads to a madcap chase where they try to beat each other to the buried cash. Deb! We're dressed up as two crazy ladies. Oh, yes. Uh, why are we dressed like this today? Well, because one of the characters in this, and larger than life, one of the greatest characters is Ethel Merman. Mm, and I people, love Ethel. Yeah, if people don't remember Ethel Merman, she was a great singer, but her comedy prowess in this picture is unbelievable. So, look at you, unbelievable. Mm. Wait, wait, do you, do you hear music? I hear music. Cool in the game? Oh yes, it's ladies' night. Bud Light, please. Tonight's ladies' night, and there's a special on Bud Light. Oh, oh really? Oh. And I'm feeling right. Oh, my right. God. It's just it's ladies, ladies' night. And I have nothing, as usual. <sighs> I feel like a Bud Light commercial. Well, while you're ladies drinking night. your Bud Light, I want to just say, the, the payoff in this picture, the thing they're all racing for is this treasure that's under a W. And I have a box of money here, and I don't want anybody Listen, taking this money. Look at this. I love your chest. Hundreds. It's beautiful, but I also love my Bud Light. Let's get to something interesting Ugh. besides your Bud Light. Let's do our paddle scores about this movie. What okay. You, you ready okay. for this? I am ready, Deb. I am so ready. Okay. And on. Three, two, two one, one, flip. Nine. 69 again. Six? Yes, and I'm going to tell you why. Okay. So well, let, me, let me let me let me jump in. So I saw this when I was a teenager. It must have been maybe on HBO when HBO was coming out, and I loved it. I, I'm like, oh, I can't wait to see this again as a reviewer. I'm watching it on Tubi, and although I love Tubi because I have lots of classic movies, I couldn't get through it. It was so long. I mean, it's what three hours and twenty minutes, and then well, if the I can jump in, it it, uh, the original cut was four hours long, right. and it was filmed in seventy millimeter Panavision for a certain which was uh, the new at theater. the time, right? Right. But let me explain something. Watching it, I couldn't get there. I'm like, find a damn treasure, and I was like, I'm like, why am I feeling this way? It's because of all the commercial breaks. With all those breaks, I mean, it's high comedy energy. You have 50 major comedians plus 300 small parts. They're all comedians. And they're, high, they're moving, they're moving. And all of a sudden, like, okay, commercial break. Oh, here we go again. I actually recommend if there's ever a playhouse or a performing arts center that's showing it in like its truest form. Because again, that Panavision was huge. And if you look at some of the shots, you see, like when they're all looking down at the chest, like you see half of them and not all of them. So I think while I, we're going to talk about this later, but I highly recommend people watch this for many reasons. I think watching it on streaming with commercials breaks the momentum. At the time when it was made, mm -hmm. talking about it is every single comedian that was of any note. Right. Stanley Kramer put in the greatest comedians of all time, even now, mm -hmm. they could never assemble a thing like this. And one of the things that Stanley Kramer allowed the comedians to do was to be comedians. You know, he was willing to work out like skits and dialogue. And in some cases, like Peter Falk, Columbo, as I remember him, um, he ad lived most of his parts. Right. And I think that's what makes this movie true a true gem and actually his favorite actor to use was spencer tracy mm -hmm. who is the lead right. and kind of i don't want to give it away but he's the, the cop who's after all these madcap crazies that are running for this treasure right and he's at the end of his career as captain of the police department mm -hmm. and he's talking about retiring and pension and you know things are just not going so he's trying to get a raise a promotion from the mayor and he's been promised, but nothing's been delivered. So 
you know, he's kind of questioning, wait a minute, we got this case where there's, you know, $350,000, mm -hmm. which in today's money would be like $3 million, I think it was? Yeah, and actually, yes, it would be $3.1 million today. This is one picture that when it went to the actors, there were two scripts. Right. They gave them two scripts. Mm -hmm. One was for dialogue right. and the other one was for action. And there, were, there was very little ad lib on this picture. He really plotted everything out. Mm -hmm. But he did allow the comedians to work in if something just didn't feel right. Because a lot of comedy is feeling whether or not something's going to be funny. Do some madcap comedy, do some slapstick comedy, you know, falling over, you know, laughing out loud. Um, I just want to like Milton Berle. So Milton Berle is a classic, not a classic comedian, but talk about drag. Mill liked to dress up <laughs> yeah, in drag he always did. For, as an entertainer. So um, that's how I remember Milton Berle. But there was also this talk about Milton Berle. Milton Berle was a big comedian, big entertainer. Oh, if you know what I, I mean. Gonna, uh, and there's truth to that, folks. Look it up. Milton okay. Berle. He had something that most other guys didn't have. I see. Uh, we mentioned Milton Berle, Buddy Hackett, Mickey Rooney, Phil Silvers, Jonathan Wil Winters. So Jonathan Winters is was a bit nuts, but he <laughs> it was a, a comedian that could get into different characters. Uh, if you remember when he started his own show, the Jonathan Winters show, he acted multiple characters. The man did have problems, though. He had mental illnesses, and actually he went to yeah. a psychiatric hospital uh, in 1959 and 1961. Right. He didn't disclose it until much later, and it was disclosed publicly. Mm -hmm. um, but I think with his high caliber and his craziness. Well, it's kind of like, the, it's akin to like how Robin Williams was exactly. now. They're very parallel mm -hmm. because he had all this instant thought and he would just do it. Mm -hmm. And actually, Joe, it was his first picture. And he wasn't in that many pictures, Jonathan Winters. But my favorite scene in the whole thing is the gas station. It is a riot. And you know the funny thing about the land that it was on? Yeah, tell me. Okay, well, the land was completely pristine. It had absolutely nothing on it. And Stanley Kramer built the cardboard balsa wood gas station. And the man who owned the land was hundreds of acres. Mm -hmm. He drove by one day and he goes, oh, my God, there's a gas station on my property. Maybe I'm rich now. Who knows? <laughs> well, the scene was two days. And after two days, it got all knocked down. It's it's the funniest scene in the whole movie. It's yeah, you got to watch that. Just yeah. that. Mm -hmm. He drove by again, and there was nothing there. And he goes, wait a minute. Was I hallucinating? Mm -hmm. Was I drunk? Am I crazy? There's nothing here. Because the, it was struck. They called right. striking the set. They took it all away. But so. Jonathan Winters actually got physical with his oh, he did. counterparts. Like, yeah. it wasn't stunts. He was physically... Tossing people around, you know. Yes, he was crazy. And Arnold Stang came into it with a broken arm. Mm -hmm. And uh, Stanley Kramer said, hi, hey, you know, I want you in it, but if you don't want to do it because of your arm, he goes, you'd have to kill me. I have no arm to be in this picture. Mm -hmm. When this movie was announced and as actors were signing up, more actors wanted to be a oh, part yeah. of it. It was like the thing to be if you were a comedian. Mm -hmm. um, that's why you see so many cameo appearances. Yes. You Let's see, talk about the cameos. Yes, Jerry Lewis. Yeah. Jerry Lewis was one of them when he ran over uh, Captain Culpepper's a hat. Yeah. Um, the Three Stooges, I love that scene when the plane is going awry and it's about to land, yes. crash land. Um, and let me just say about mm -hmm. the Three Stooges as well. When the Three Stooges were in it, and they have, I think it's only maybe a 10-second spot. They're dressed as firemen, and they're serious. When it was in the theater, everybody in the theater stood up and cheered to see the Three Stooges. Mm -hmm. And it was the only time the Three Stooges were in something where they were serious, and they looked like they were capable to solve a situation. Ethel Merman, who uh, I'm dressed up as Ethel <laughs> Merman. She was the best. I mean, if, if you're gay, you know who Ethel Merman is, uh, if you have a certain age, of course. But she had such a interesting career. I mean, she was considered the woman of musical stage. She sang and talked to the balcony of each theater, so she carried that through in film. Um, she had an interesting uh, career. Not only was she in this movie and played an instrumental role in it, uh, but she played in parts like on Batman, if you remember the Batman sitcom. Yes. Yeah. Lola Lasagna. I love oh, it. Oh, I didn't know. I yes. forgot about that. Yep. She appeared yeah. in several episodes. And then uh, she also had a disco album. Oh, Which come was on. trash. Really? They, the critics hated it, but the gays loved it. And they played it every night at Studio See, 54 in New York City. I'm learning. 
Like, I had no idea about that. Oh, that's where my gayness comes shining through. There was this notable camaraderie with all the comedians. They all wanted this to be a success, and it actually was a success. It was considered one of the most expensive films at that time. I believe it was nine million, um, yeah. and then it grossed in the box office sixty million. Um, and looking at the research and trying to put yourself back on the, in that premiere date when it was first shown to a public audience. Yeah. Um, they had a, a 20 minute intermission. And if you actually watch the movie, intermission comes up yeah. right in the middle. But in the theater, they actually played like um, police officers talking over a radio, yes. which continued the story. You right. went to have popcorn, you went to get a soda or something. I love that Over stuff. the speaker, yeah. I mean, yeah. That, it, was, it was truly not only a cinematic success and a classic, but theatrically, and that's why I go back to I would love to have that recreated in a theater. Yes. To be able to watch it, to be able to hear it, and have that intermission where, wow, the story is going on while you're getting something to eat. Spencer Tracy was 63 when he, and he looks 73. Everybody right. looked so much older back then. They just did. Uh, and but that's why but, we look fabulous because we're just, we, um, we're ageless. That, that, like you said before, that had the most speaking parts in any film, mm -hmm. 300. She didn't comment to the ageless. I was complimenting 50, her folks. She just like. It was the second highest grossing film, but the number one grossing film that year, do you know what it was? No. The Carpet Baggers with George oh. Papard, because George Papard was kind of like a heartthrob back then. Mm -hmm. Jimmy Durante. Mm -hmm. I mean, he barely was in anything we ever saw. And in the beginning, it's funny because he tells them about the treasure and then he literally kicks the bucket. Yes. And the stuntman that kicked the bucket, they brought a stuntman in to kick the bucket. They had a hundred stuntmen working mm -hmm. in the United States at that time. There were only a hundred stuntmen. 80 of them worked on this film. Didn't it take them a whole year to film? Oh yeah. I mean, it was incredibly I mean, it was very long, but everybody knew that it was going to be a hit. They just knew. The titles of the movie are, they did this a lot in the 60s. They used drawings and mm -hmm. cartoons. And that was Saul Bass again, who we talked about in another film in the past, who did everything from The Man with the Golden Arm, if mm -hmm. you remember that, yep. Frank Sinatra, to Exodus, Anatomy of a Murder, Peanuts, and Fractured Fairy Tales, and Magoo. What I loved about The Chase because yeah. that's a major piece of the film. At one point, they're all following each other real slowly because no one wants to get ahead of each <laughs> other and just so like eyeing each other, and then they break off. And I think that's when each comedian shines. Yes. Um, you have uh, Jonathan Winters, when they, they leave him on the road and he gets a bike and he's pedaling through this desert. In the scenes in the desert, it's deserted. You see these long ro roads. And it was filmed, I think, in Palm Springs when it was like yes. 120 degree weather. <laughs> yeah. And then you had Sid Caesar, who was able to get a plane, if I remember correctly. Yes. And then gets there first, but then gets locked in a store, a hardware store, and he's using blow torches and he's trying to use like dynamite. Everything and in the hardware everything store. Everything in the hardware yeah. store basement. Then you had Mickey Rooney and Buddy Hackett. They get on a plane too, but the person that's flying the plane is, help me out. Jim Bacchus. Jim Bacchus gets trashed. <laughs> and all of a sudden, Mickey Rooney and Buddy Hackett, wait, we don't know how to fly a plane. So you see this crazy up and down and flying and right. up and down, and they're trying to land the plane. And that's when the Three Stooges appear, when yes. the firemen yeah. appear. The great thing about it, the movie trailer says, they try to get the treasure by land, sea, and air. Mm -hmm. And they show land, the bicycle, the crazy cars crashing. See, they show Phil Silvers down mm -hmm. with his car floating right, in the river. Right, in the water, and, and the little air, boy. The plane goes mm -hmm. through a Pepsi-Cola billboard. Mm -hmm. And then, and knocks Paul Ford out of the tower. He's he's what it. So it's like a a, a 1960s airplane right. with all these little bits. Right. And they are really they're really funny. They're looking for this W, and mm. they're all crazy, and they don't know what they're looking you know everywhere, and they're running by these palm trees that are in the shape of a giant W. Mm -hmm. The W of the trees. Those are real trees. Yes. And they were there until I believe they had a terrible storm in February 4th, 2004, mm -hmm. and they blew down and there's only one tree left. And then Spencer Tracy comes in and he's listening and he's like, wait a minute, I know where that treasure is. And then he intercedes right at the point where they find the hidden treasure. They're digging up, everyone's digging, everyone's yes, fighting. They're trying to renegotiate 
there all you go, the cashola. The millions, that's it. And they're trying to figure out the percentages. Remember, because the, in the movie, they were arguing over how many pieces of the pie, the treasure, they right. should get. And that's what actually sets them off like, I'm out of here. Who's going to get it first? And everybody wants it? a piece, even the cab drivers at that point, everybody. They chase Spencer Tracy into a building. Mm -hmm. And that's funny because the firemen come to say, I think it was Everett Horton is the fireman that goes up on the giant ladder and they all get on the ladder together right. and it's swinging right. and one by one they fling off into mm -hmm. the, it, I don't know, I thought it was really clever. Yeah, and you don't see that anymore. You no. don't see that kind of like madcap slapstick comedy. Right. Let's talk about the importance of this film in the time that it took place. Okay. Um, 1963, a lot of civil unrest in yeah. the United States. Not only civil unrest, but you had social change happening at yeah. the same time. Um, you had the Birmingham bombings. You had the Woolworth sit-in mm -hmm. when African-American students sat in a whites-only uh, counter. And yeah. they were not only um, brutally accosted, but beaten and then jailed. Yeah. Um, two weeks later, you had the assassination of activist Megger Evers, oh, and then Mr. you had the Evers March on Washington, yeah. where uh, Martin Luther King, Dr. Martin Luther right. King, gave his famous I Have a Dream speech. Mad, 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 Mad World came out in November, and many historians say that was a way for people to get a little bit of comedic right. relief. But I'll say this with all due respect, it was the relief for white America. Because if you look at the film, there were maybe three African-Americans in it. Um, and there was no major role in anyone of a color other than white. So while it was comic relief and to get people out of, oh my God, there's all this bad stuff that's happening in the United States, uh, it was for white America. So viewers, if you watch this film or you have any knowledge of where it's playing outside the streaming service with a bunch of commercials, right. please let us know. I would like to know because I would love to see this film in its true form, truest form. Right. Um, because it's just, it's a classic comedy and people should go see it. Well, and, and for viewers too, please, you know, Turner Classic Movies, I, I know a lot of people don't even know about that channel. That is classic cinema. And of course, Turner is uninterrupted, no commercials. Mm -hmm. And before a film, most of the times, and after, one of the hosts will come on and tell you about it. Right. Um, so, you know, it's really, check it out. Yeah. And Turner has a great guide that you can look up online and see everything that's free every month. Is it time for the watch list? Debbie? Let's go into the watch list. Here we go. Okay, my watch list this month, or this week, I should say. Number one, the Russians are coming, the Russians are coming. Mm. This movie is slightly dated, but it is so important to comedy at the time. And it starred Carl Reiner and Alan Arkin from 1966. Personally, I saw this movie four times in the theater. And I took my aunt once who couldn't hear and she kept going, what, what? And I had to keep repeating everything. And also Mel Brooks is the producers, both of them, the old yes. and the new, the old with Zero Mostel and Gene Wilder mm -hmm. and the new one with Matthew Broderick and Nathan Lane, which was made into a Broadway show. It's hysterical mm -hmm. about two producers who think they're gonna make a ton of money by putting on the worst Broadway show ever. And it is brilliant. Okay, I think you mentioned The Rat Race, mm -hmm. which is 2001, featuring a crazy cast, and part of the crazy cast was Rowan Atkinson, who's Mr. Bean, and John Cleese from Monty Python, mm -hmm. and it's a story about a Las Vegas casino owner who wanted to do a new wagering scheme, and he sets up a race for money across the country. I think it's okay to watch if you want to see a race picture, but, you know, didn't have the power of Mad Mad World, and also The Cannonball Run. Mm. In 1981, yeah. it starts Burt Reynolds and Dom DeLuise. Dom DeLuise was a riot of a comedian. Burt Reynolds was it, especially after his play, Playgirl Centerfold. Uh, it's a cross-country car race from Connecticut to California with a cast of zany characters again, although not as clever as Mad Mad World, I must say. So that's my watch list this week, Joe. I love it, thank you. 
Lenny Pike would have gotten to the treasure first if he got his bike fixed at Bob's Bicycle Service. Bob's Bicycle Service, located at 4 Mark Road in Kenilworth, New Jersey, is owned and operated by Bob Masucci. With decades of experience in bicycle repairs, adjustments, new bicycle assemblies, overhauls, and simple tune-ups of bicycles for young and old. Bob's Bicycle Service is a proud supporter of the Real Watchlist Plus and donor of the Surrey that appeared in the iconic short reel Debbie and Joe's Oscar Day Part 2. I am Will Smith to your Chris Rock. Find your path and ride on with Bob's Bicycle Service. On Shug approved this message. I just love you. I just love you. <laughs> you know what? I, I gave you my score. Mm -hmm. And I really still believe it's a nine. And I think you should raise it after we talked about all this stuff today. What do you think? Well, Debbie, you bring up a good point. Um, like I said, I think Tubi's format in streaming with the commercials ruined it for me. Yeah. But I will say if it was in a theater or if I had it on DVD, I would turn my six yeah. to a nine. I'm glad you changed your score. Thank you. And forevermore, it'll be a mad, 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 mad world. world. One, two. One, two, three. There's no show like the real watchless. There's no show that we know. Don't forget the and the plus behind it. Everything we do is a delight. Deb and Joe are so insanely crazy, but they have knowledge and hope they're right. We love classics. We rate classics. We judge them with our scores. You can see us once a week at 6 p.m. with new reviews to tantalize. YouTube, Facebook, Instagram, and Google, too. It's all media films. Tune in to our new show. Cha-cha-cha.